Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I am, as you can see right there, I am the uh, senior producer over here at Collider Video, and I am so glad you decided to make me a part of your Sunday morning here before going off shopping, watching movies, watching football, whatever it is you like to do on your Sunday afternoon. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I just got back from New York had a good time out there meeting with the leadership of Complex. Complex is, of course, the company that owns Collider uh, and has a lot of media brands out there. Uh, Complex is a, is a great company. And ever since we moved the move, uh, made the move over from AMC after I left there over to Complex, I uh, got to tell you, I think things have been great. I think the audience has been getting good stuff. And I cannot wait to show you some of the big things we've got planned for the future that came out of these meetings in New York. Um, you know, we're getting everything kind of put together and finalized. I don't want to say anything specifically right now, just in case, you know, a million things can go wrong. But we got some things in the pipeline right here, right now that I'm really excited about and I cannot wait to show you. Now, Mailbag is basically the most laid back, in case you haven't watched Mailbag before. This is kind of laid back. It's just me in the office today. Uh, here on Sunday morning, and it's a more laid back, relaxed. We talk about anything. It's much more casual. And how do you get your question on the show? It's really simple. You just send an email to us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Once again, that email address is collidervideo at gmail.com. Send that in. Maybe you'll get lucky and you'll see your question pop up here on Mailbag on the weekend. So maybe you'll see it pop up Monday through Friday on Movie Talk. All right. Now, with all that out of the way, Let's get to the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Rild Albanese, who writes, Campia, that's me, has said that the next step for CGI is to be able to create realistic people. They haven't been able to capture the emotion of humans yet. When they eventually get there, do you think that we could see CGI versions of classic actors and actresses starring in new roles? On one hand, I hate it because you don't have the actual actor's artistic sensibilities and you're more doing an impression. On the other hand, it would be very I would be very curious and intrigued to see a CGI version of Jimmy Stewart or Cary Grant or Grace Kelly starring in a movie. Granted, reluctantly curious and intrigued. All right, Ryan, well, thanks a lot for the question. Yeah, that has been, we talk about it every once in a while, that's been the, like the, the golden egg, if you will, of the whole CGI world. The one thing they have not been able to really capture yet is human performance. Why? Not because human performance is any more difficult than lion performance or spaceship performance, whatever, but it's our perception. You see, we don't watch um, giant transforming robots every day in live, in, in, in person, right? We are not used to day in, day out, 20 hours a day or 18 hours a day watching our whole lives interacting with a live, actual, real Cybertonian Transformer robot. So when they go on screen, whatever kind of their interpretation of that's the way it should be, but, but we are, our minds are wired. We know how humans move and flinch and you know, breathe. And we are, because we are exposed to it 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 hours a day for our entire lives. And when it's not done perfectly right, it stands out glaring to us. So that's why it's been very tricky and difficult for them to really nail that. Not because it's any more difficult than all the other things, but you can do it to a certain degree with all the other things is fine. You can do it to the same degree with human characters and it's not fine. And that's the trick. So the question then come, that you raise is, okay, some of these great classic actors of eras gone by, if we ever really zone in and are able to nail the realistic CGI human form, what about the possibility of having a Cary Grant uh, starring in a movie with us once again? Um, what about the possibility of having Heath Ledger come back and um, come back and play the role of the Joker one more time? You know, what about all these great uh, actors and actresses who have passed away in the, you know, in the past that we want to come back and do more roles, uh, whether it's a, a Seymour, a, a Seymour Hoffman, Philip Seymour Hoffman, um, or, or other actors like that. I have to say 
while I completely understand the curiosity, I would lean personally, this is just my opinion, I would lean really towards the side of do not do that because it's not that actor. It's not Cary Grant. It's not Heath Ledger. It's not Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's just something that looks like them. It's not actually them. What made Heath Ledger a great Joker wasn't because he looked like Heath Ledger. It was because of the performance that Heath Ledger brought to the Joker. What made Philip Seymour Hoffman so great in Capote was not because he looked like Philip Seymour Hoffman, but because of the performance that Philip Seymour Hoffman brought to Capote. And if we got into the habit or opened up the floodgates of saying, hey, this brand new movie starring Orson Welles, you know, if, if we got into that habit, it, it would be deceptive. Even if all the audience knew it's just a CGI figure, it still feels deceptive. Plus, there would be a rights issue. I mean, you can't just go and use the likeness of somebody without their permission or the permission of their family. You can't just go and use their likeness unless... Before dying, they signed away the rights for, you know, if, uh, I don't know, let's say Harrison Ford right now, while still alive, he signed an agreement, hey, Paramount Pictures, I give you, me personally, I give you my permission to use my likeness in any movies you have going forward, just pay the salary to my family or my estate. Unless there's a weird situation like that, you would have to go and get permission from the families, and I, it's just, to me, it's just creepy and wrong. Because you can put up... Heath Ledger or Philip Seymour Hoffman or any of the great actors and actresses of days gone by, you can put their form up there, but it's not them. So what's the point? Um, so while it would definitely present an opportunity to do that and an opportunity to do that as, um, as I heard one comedian, uh, Patton Oswalt actually once say, just because you coulda, doesn't mean you shoulda. Um, and so just because we have the capability of doing something like that, I don't think it would be the right thing to do. I think it would lack value. I think because it's not really them, it's not their performance, it's just a cheap imitation without being all that cheap. So me personally, I think it's a great question. And I don't think there's necessarily a wrong answer. Like I said, that's just the way I look at it. You may have a totally different interpretation of it, and that's cool too. But for me personally, I would never want to see it done. Thanks a lot for the question. All right, let's move on to the next one. And the next question today comes to us from Dion Lee, who writes, Hey, Movie Talk. I watched Mortal Kombat Annihilation, and wow, was that a terrible movie. Yes, Dion, yes, it was. My question is, would a Mortal Kombat reboot work done today with the raid-style fighting sequences and a darker tone? Thanks, and keep up the filthy. Um, right now, the raid... And thanks a lot for the question. The Raid is kind of the flavor of the month right now. The Raid is awesome. But just as Joss Whedon, who is awesome, was flavor of the month, and Christopher Nolan is flavor of the month in sort of way. And what I mean by that is that they're the hot thing right now, and so everybody thinks that should be employed with everything. Like, right after Avengers came out, every movie that was coming out, people would think, oh, you know who should direct that? Joss Whedon. You know who should direct that? Joss Whedon. You know who should direct that? Joss Whedon. And whenever a new Christopher Nolan movie comes out, that's that's really good. It, inevitably, it's, oh, you know who they got to get to direct the new Pac-Man movie? Christopher Nolan. You know who got, they got to get to bring in to do the new Rainbow Bright movie? Christopher Nolan. It's Christopher Nolan everything. And right now, the hot sauce is The Raid. And for good reason, just like for good reason Joss Whedon was hot, just for good reasons that Christopher Nolan is hot, The Raid is hot because it's awesome. But now everybody, you know, a lot of movies that have any sort of action, I hear a lot of people saying, hey, they should do that the raid style. It almost, it feels like almost it doesn't matter what movie it is. They should do that the raid style. And I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, the raid style and the raid, raid, uh, raid fighting style, they work best for the raid. And they would work really well for some other properties too. But just because it works great for certain properties doesn't mean I think you can take it. And I'm sure you don't think so either. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it means you can just take it and apply it to anything and it would just work just as well. I don't think that's the case. Now, pure fighting style, no, I don't think so. And, and darker tone, I also don't think so because... While the original Mortal and I know you're talking about Annihilation, but while that original Mortal Kombat movie um, is, is, is awful, it's beloved by people like me, and I know Mark Ellis and a bunch of other people, we love that movie. Even though it's cheesy and, and whatever, 
We love that movie. And I think that's what made it st sticks with us after decades. It sticks with us and we still think about it and we still love it and we still appreciate it. I think if you're going to do Mortal Kombat, I think this is just like, again, just my personal opinion. I would like to see them stick with that quasi half serious, decent action, a bit of campiness without going ridiculously over the top. John, you had an, a four-armed monster. How are you not going ridiculously over the top? Yeah, 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 I know. I, uh, I understand. But just follow me anyway. Um, you know, I, I think you keep a little bit of cheese and a little bit of cam. I, because I think that's part of the texture of what made Mortal Kombat, the movie, so beloved. Now, you can absolutely try a whole new take on Mortal Kombat. But then what makes it distinct? What makes it different? Because a lot of movies right now, ever since The Dark Knight Returns, ever since the original X-Men movie, everybody seems to think there's a formula. Darker is better. Just make it dark and that's better. And sometimes dark is the right thing for a certain property, but it's not right for all the movies that try to incorporate. Make it dark. Dark means good. Dark means quality. No, dark just means dark. You know? Um, and for some movies, that'll work. For some movies, it won't. I just don't think we should create a blanket statement for everything. You know what that movie needs? More jokes. Well, for comedies, yes. For some dramedies, yes. Uh, for certain things, yes. But in other things, Schindler's List didn't need more jokes. Jokes are good. Schindler's List did not need more jokes. Um, so it's, it's all a matter of style and fit. And while I think there is something there about a, re a complete reimagining of Mortal Kombat, going back to the drawing board, and pulling out a darker, more serious, super ultra-violent kind of mortal. I, I, there's a possibility there. There are things you could do there. Personally, the thing that I loved about the original, even though it's a bad movie, but the thing I love about the original was that campiness and that cheese and the, and the, the slightly more lighthearted tone. Even though the world was at stake, a little bit more of a lighthearted tone. So uh, my personal opinion would be I would I would not want to see them go raid style dark tone stuff like that but if they did it I would certainly give it a shot I mean maybe it could work and it could work great thanks a lot jump in the comment section let us know what you think would you want them to still maintain and hold on to, the, to that little bit of a campiness feel that the original had or would you like to see them completely reimagine it blow it up and go to something like totally different now and go with what is the popular trend more dark more violent stuff like that things like that who knows maybe that would work jump in the comment section and let me know your thoughts on that. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from William Atanaga, who writes, Hey guys, I want to say that I just seen Big Hero 6. I love that movie, by the way. I've just seen Big Hero 6, which was Disney Animation's first Marvel property. I was wondering, since Marvel had put The Runaways on the shelf and couldn't get it made, is there any chance that it could be made by Disney Animation as their next property? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Runaways, um, I, I actually got first introduced to the Runaways by my wife. My wife's a big fan of the Runaways. she got like this collection of Runaways uh, uh, volumes at home. And it was very, very close to being made into the film. It, it, they, they had it in, in a production pipeline. They were getting close to doing it, and then it got shelved. Now, for whatever reason that it got shelved, I've never heard a definitive answer about that, about why it got shelved. I've also never heard definitively that it's permanently shelved. Um, so just because it's shelved doesn't mean it's like like thrown away. Maybe they'll get around to it again. But Runaways does seem like a property that could lend itself to a Disney animation thing. My one problem with that would be that it probably wouldn't be very true to the actual comic. Now, you know me. The, the first rule, the first responsibility of filmmakers is not to stay true to the source material. That's not your first responsibility. First responsibility is make a great movie. Big Hero 6 is not very true to the source material. But it's a great movie, and I love that movie. Um, despite the fact that it had a pretty weak villain. I've, I'm finding a lot of great movies, especially around comic book stuff. They can be great and yet have a bad villain. It's, it's kind of, I, I want to think about that more. But anyway... Um, and so if they did the runways, I'm initially kind of turned off because I know they probably, there's some darker stuff in there. 
And I don't think they would stay very true to the source material. Now, that being said, like we just said, Big Hero 6 didn't exactly stay true to the source material. Turned out to be a wonderful motion picture. And I think there is some possibility there for like a Big Hero, or not a Big Hero 6, a Runaways to do that. I would hope they would lean a little more edgy. Not as edgy as the comic book is, but lean a little bit more that way. Say a little bit more than Big Hero 6 was. Um, and I think... There's, uh, there's some possibilities there. So anyway, thanks a lot for the question. Let's move on to the next one. And the next question today comes to us from Michael Kennedy. And Michael Kennedy writes, I remember a few years ago reading a story about Kathleen Kennedy saying that the new Star Wars films will not have as much secrecy as the prequels. I know we didn't get to see too much from the prequels before they were released, but The Force Awakens has taken it to a whole new level. Do you think this is mainly because of J.J. Abrams or will all future Star Wars films try to continue this secret squirrels game? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Michael. Um, a, a lot of it has to do, a lot of the secrecy with Star Wars The Force Awakens has to do with J.J. Abrams. Now, if J.J. Abrams wanted to keep everything top secret but Kathleen Kennedy didn't, guess what? They wouldn't be keeping it secret because Kathleen Kennedy is the boss. Um, that being said, um, I know, for instance, uh, I had a representative from Marvel tell me that the only reason I did not go to a Star Wars set visit was because J.J. Abrams does not allow set visits. Um, and that in future Star Wars movies, I will probably get a set visit. So there, I think you're right. There is definitely a part there that is J.J. Abrams' influence. But I'm going to tell you this. I like that J.J. Abrams keeps a tight lid on things. I We have gotten to the point now, and we talk about this every once in a while, because you know we get a lot of questions on Movie Talk about, why haven't we seen a trailer for this movie that doesn't open for seven more years? Why haven't we seen, oh my gosh, it's eight months until this movie comes out. How come we have not seen a trailer for it yet? Because it's eight months away. I mean, we've just gotten to the point now that we want all this material so far in advance, and that's not, despite the fact that we want it, it's not necessarily what's best for the movie. And personally, I like that J.J. has kept a tighter wrap on things. And even then, remember this, the first teaser for Star Wars The Force Awakens came out last December. It came out almost a year ago. So, and then they put out another one, a Star Wars celebration in June, I think it is, April or June. Um... They put out another one also well in advance. So uh, while the only thing they've been really keeping really tight lid is details in the story. And I think we're all happy that they're keeping a lot of lids uh, sealed on the details of the story. But really, when you think about it, it's not like they've been keeping this whole movie under wraps. They've been doing promotions. New TV spots have dropped. We're still over a month away from the movie coming out. New TV spots are dropped. A new international trailer just came out, which everybody was talking about online. That was great, wasn't it? Um... The first trailer came a year ago. I mean, it's it's not like this this movie's been kept in a vault and you're not going to know one thing about this movie until it opens. No, we know an awful lot. We know all the uh, most of the characters, we know the names of all the characters, we know who's playing the characters. We've got several trailers, TV spots are now dropping. So, this big veil of secrecy hasn't really been all that tight. And the things that are secret, I think are things we want to be kept secret. I think by the time when we see Luke Skywalker for the first time in um, uh, The Force Awakens, I think we're all going to be pretty damn glad that we didn't know where Luke was prior to watching the movie. When we find out what's really going on with Finn in The Force Awakens, I think we're going to be glad we didn't already know that in advance. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not like it would be spoilers and it would, wouldn't ruin the movie, but I think it's kind of cool the way they're approaching it. So... Will it be a little bit looser once we get into the Star Wars movies that aren't directed by J.J. Abrams? Yeah, probably. But I really hope it's not much looser because I kind of like the way they've been handling it. And look at the advanced ticket sales. Clearly, the way they've been handling it is working. So anyway, thanks a lot for the question, man. All right, let's move on to the next one. And the next one today comes to us from Andrew Smith, who writes... Hello from England. Hello, Andrew. Um, I have a question regarding budgets for movies. How does something like The Man from U.N.C.L.E. cost $75 million? 
Hollywood wants to make a profit, yet they spend incredible amounts of money on, a, on budgets and are surprised when they don't make it back. Why don't big studios spend less money on these things as they'd be more likely to see a profit? Well, thanks a lot for the, uh, for the question, Andrew. And on one hand, you are preaching to the choir, my brother. Amen. I have been saying for a long time that one of the big systemic problems in Hollywood is the fact that spending on movies has gone way out of control. Gone way out of control. And, and, and then what happens? That means studios have to see more profits, have to see more box office returns in order to make a profit, which means part of that solution is not only getting more people to the theater, but also means charging more for tickets. Um, it all comes back to you know, how much studios spend to make their movies. There's a direct correlation between that and how much you then pay for a movie ticket to go see. Now, I still maintain. Well, absolutely, going to the movies today, go, buying a movie ticket today, how much it costs to buy popcorn and soda, that's up to you. If you want to buy pop and popcorn and soda, that's totally your thing. I'm just talking about buying a movie ticket. If you want to buy a movie ticket, the average, I looked it up, the average movie ticket cost in America is like around $9, okay? In Los Angeles, um, if I, you know, my, let me grab it here. My, I keep these right beside my Jabba uh, over there. But my um, ticket here for uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens on Thursday the 12th costs $19, now, that's a premium theater. I'm seeing it in the new Dolby Cinema at AMC Prime. It's a premium theater with leather recliners and Dolby, Dolby Atmos sound and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's all there. You know what? Let me see if I can add this shot. I don't know if I can or not. I'm going to try. Uh, that's a horrible shot, but let me show you this. So there's Jabba sitting there, and I don't think you can see him there, but... There are my Star Wars tickets. I got Jabba guarding my Star Wars tickets right now. So thank you, Jabba, for all of your hard work and protecting my tickets. Um, anyway, uh, what were we even talking about? I totally forget what we were talking about now. Film budgets, that's right. Um, uh, there, is a, there is a direct correlation between how much studios spend on this. And so then I remember getting into debates before. I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. But I remember getting into debates with this uh, one friend of mine. And me and my friends, we love to debate movie topics, but give this one debate where, you know, I made the argument, it is ridiculous that Robert Downey Jr. is getting paid as much money as he is for the event. It's just, it's ridiculous. Brain surgeons who save people's lives aren't getting one 20th of what Robert Downey Jr. is getting. He's just getting too much. He's, no, no, he deserves every penny. We should pay him all the money and pay all the people in the Avengers all the money and blah, blah, blah. And then he complained to me about having to pay 13 bucks for a movie ticket. And I'm like, you do realize there is a direct correlation between you saying, yeah, let's just pay all their movie stars. That means they're better than us. Let's give them $25 million for three months work. Let's do that. And then you whine and complain that a movie ticket is $13 or $15 or $12.99 or whatever it is you want to go. You can't have one. You can't have your cake and eat it too, okay? You cannot have your cake and eat it too. There is a systemic problem in the movie industry today that results in higher ticket prices for a lot of people. And I still maintain, even at $19, okay? Even at $19, that is cheaper than me going to Red Robin, if you've got a Red Robin restaurant near you. That is cheaper than me going to Red Robin, ordering a burger, some fries, and a drink. Because after tax and tip, I'm paying over 20 bucks. So it's, and I'm getting two hours of entertainment, two hours and 20 minutes of entertainment at the movie. So to me, even the highest of ticket prices, like $19 for this, it is, that's to me is still a decent value. But there is no denying that even though I think it's a decent value, a lot of people do not. And understandably so, because not 10 years ago, they were spending $7 to go to the movies. And now they're paying more than double. So it's understandable there's a systemic problem. Now, now let me get off that tangent and get back to the core of your question. You know, why are the movies spending so much? I will say this as well, though. A $75 million budget is not a crazy... Uh, personally, I don't think it's a crazy, unreasonable price tag for a major Hollywood feature that is an era piece set in a time period with significant modern stars... That is action. Uh, you think, just think about the costuming and the sets and the locations and everything you got to do to make that movie. 
I thought, do I think 75 million was a little expensive for what we got in Man From U.N.C.L.E.? Yeah, but it was, I think it was within the realm of acceptability, maybe near the high end of acceptability because you got a lot of movies that come out that are 140 million, 170 million, you know, $200 million to make a movie that there is just no rational explanation about why those movies should cost so much. Just shouldn't. Because you make a movie that costs $200 million minimum, you need to make about 420, 425, 425 million at the worldwide box office just to break even. Okay, when you're spending that much money, you know, you make a movie like uh, A Man From U.N.C.L.E., you probably got to pull in about 140, 150 million worldwide in order to break even. But I think a good argument can be made why, hey, I can understand why the studio thought this movie with this cast, and I thought it was a great movie. I really enjoyed Man From U.N.C.L.E. I thought it was a really good movie fun, entertaining, thought the cast had great chemistry together. We talked a little bit about it on yesterday's mailbag as well. I think a studio could be totally forgiven thinking, we think we can make 150, 200 million worldwide on this movie without too much problem. So therefore, a $75 million budget, considering it's a period piece, the actors we have involved, the action that we're going to have involved, the stunts, the visual effects we're going to have. I actually think that's kind of a reasonable one. But once again, that's reasonable in an era that it's standard that a big, you know, an action film will have a $150 million budget, a $200 million budget. That's got to end. That has got to end. All right? Because when Neil Blomkamp can make District 9 for, I can't even remember how much he made that movie for. I think it was $30 million. Um now, granted, he was working with a studio that he was friends with. That did Well, guess what? Every studio has studios they're friends with. Just, you know, be more reasonable. Make, be, make better decisions about how you make your movies. Because I, I guarantee you, if District 9 had been made by, uh, I don't know, Disney at the time, and it's the exact same visual effects, everything, instead of $30 million budget, that movie would have been a $120 million budget. And it would have starred, um, you know, Robert De Niro. <laughs> and, or, or it would have starred uh, uh, Ryan Gosling as the big star. Instead of just a really good actor who nobody knew, and we put him in the movie, and he'll be the lead star. And, you know, it's just these types of decisions, it does drive me nuts. It is a pet peeve of mine um, about the film industry right now is how much they spend on money, uh, on movies and things like that. So I'm really glad you brought up, and I'm sure you'll hear me bitch and moan and complain about this topic again on a movie talk coming up soon. Thanks a lot for the question. All right, we got three more to go. So let's get to this one. This one comes from Julian Griffith, who writes... Massive fan from another one from London and my journeys to work on the London Underground would not be the same without you to make my day. Well, thanks a lot, Julian. I'm really honored that you would make us part of your day like that. Have you guys ever considered doing commentary tracks for films which could be made available for us fans to buy online? You guys are so knowledgeable uh, of the industry and have such great chemistry together. I think it would be a great fit. Thanks for your time and all the terrific work that you do. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Julian. And as a matter of fact... I've mentioned this on Movie Talk, I think, last week. Um, me, Schnepp, Christian Harloff, and Mark Ellis. Um, starting this week, I think we're going to do it on Wednesday. We are going to do a running commentary of all six Star Wars movies. Uh, and release one a week leading up to the release of Star Wars The Force Awakens. So, <clears throat> this Wednesday... We are going to sit down and watch The Phantom Menace. And what we're going to do is you're not going to see the movie, but you're going to see us watching the movie together and talking uh, about the movie throughout it. The camera's going to be on us. And uh, we're going to let you know, uh, you know, we're watching the DVD of The Phantom Menace and the opening title is on now and opening crawl begins. So you'll know you'll be able to sync up with us if you want to watch The Phantom Menace on your computer at home on, on one window and then have a YouTube channel open with us talking about the movie here. You can join us. Um, we think it's going to be a lot of fun. And we're going to do one a week, like I said, up until when Star Wars The Force Awakens comes out. But we're not charging for it. It's not going to be behind a paywall. It's going to be free. We're just going to put up on the YouTube channel uh, so you guys can watch it. I And then you guys let us know. Do you think it was fun? Do you think that was a stupid idea? I mean, other people do stuff like this, but you know, we thought 
it's kind of crazy that we are the biggest Star Wars fans in the world. We should probably do something for Star Wars like this. And so we're doing it. You guys let us know what you think about it. We've actually been talking about this for months. Um, and now is the time we're going to do it this Wednesday. Keep your eye open. Our first commentary track. Watch along with us as we watch The Phantom Menace. Anyway, hope you guys will join us for that. All right, second last question of the day today. And this one comes from Nicola Strubeck, who writes, My question concerns the new movie in the Harry Potter world, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. People keep calling it a prequel to the Harry Potter movies. Even you guys called it that. But is it really? As far as I know, it has nothing to do with the Harry Potter movies. It's not uh, a telling of what led up to the Harry Potter story. It's taking place in the same world, but a lot earlier and completely different characters. It's like uh, calling the Captain America 1 movie a prequel to Iron Man. Does it take place in the same world? It does take place in the same world, but it's not really a prequel in my opinion. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Nicola. Um, it's First, there's a couple of really weird questions you got to ask here because the first question you got to ask is, well, we don't really know what the movie is yet, right? And then even if we did know it really what the movie is, what, how do you define a prequel? A prequel is kind of a word that got made up like 15 years ago or 20 years ago, whenever The Phantom Menace really came out. Um, it was never a popular term until Star Wars The Phantom Menace came out that the term prequel really started being used. So what is a prequel? And then whatever definition you come up with, and different people will come up with different definitions, does that definition then fit into what Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them actually is? Now, I feel right now comfortable, I feel comfortable referring to Fantastic Beasts as a prequel only because that in the description from Warner Brothers, we've heard, we've they've said, we are going to see characters that we know. We are going to be revisited by characters that we uh, that we are aware of and that we've come to know in the Harry Potter franchise. Now, whether that means Dumbledore or whether that means the uh, Maggie Smith character or whether that means a younger Hagrid, I mean, I, I don't know. And to what extent they will be used in the movie, I don't know. Um, now, there's definitely a different central character, Newt Scamander. I, I, I never know how to pronounce the last name, but I think it's Newt Scamander. Anyway, is the key central figure, not Harry Potter, not Hermione. Not, this is like years before them. But if there is enough tie-in, particularly with characters, like if Dumbledore and the Maggie Smith character and, let's say, a younger Hagrid, and if they're like all there, and there's enough tie-in with the Harry Potter movies with that many characters, then I would be comfortable calling it a prequel. If, however, um, like the Maggie Smith character is the only one who pops up and she's only in it for a minute, then I'm comfortable with somebody like you saying it's not a prequel. Really. I mean, it, it takes place in the same universe, but it's not a prequel. See, Captain America, the first Captain America, the, the first Avenger, it was completely separated from Iron Man. You know, other than the fact that we uh, uh, saw Tony's dad, although I, I can't even remember now if we saw Tony's dad. No, I don't think we saw Tony's dad in the first one, did we? Maybe we saw Tony's dad, I can't remember. But even if we did, it was only for a short minute. And then Tony's dad plays this key part in the thing, but I don't think that's enough of a connection. Just a key minute in one movie, significant in another, I don't think that's enough of a connection uh, that really has it overlap. So I'm comfortable saying Captain America of the First Avenger is not a prequel to Iron Man. Um, so it, like I said, it raises a lot of questions. How do you define a prequel? And then once you answer that question, we got to see Fantastic Beasts and where to find them to really know if that definition, whatever that definition is, applies to Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Like I said, for now, I'm personally comfortable calling it a prequel because it sounds like there's going to be significant character tie-ins. Um, but if it, that doesn't turn out to be the case, then I'm totally fine not calling it a prequel. We're just going to have to wait and see when the movie comes out, but it's a great question. All right, final question, not only of the day, but of the weekend. And this final question comes to us from Mondo Dito, who writes... Hello from Brazil, Collider Crew. Hello, Mono. Just finished watching the UFC last night, which took place from Brazil. Um, love the shows. After watching the Fox insulting episode, uh, this came to my mind. Star Wars trailers are making a move to promote John Boyega as the Jedi of the movie. But we all suspect that Daisy Ridley is the new Jedi. 
can this backlash at Disney? Because they used a black actor to make a publicity stunt to hide key plot information. Look, I know this sounds stupid as hell, but we have all kinds of stupid people in the world. Amen, brother. Amen. Yes, it does sound stupid. And I, and I totally understand why you're asking, because there are a lot of stupid people in the world. Um, the very fact that so many people bought into that Jar Jar theory. Anyway, um, look, the, the notion of marketing, doing a little bit of misdirecting. Now, misdirecting is different than false advertising, okay? Like false advertising is like, chron uh, not Chronicles of Narnia, Bridge to Terabithia. Remember, we, we talk about this Disney movie every once in a while, Bridge to Terabithia. It was completely advertised as a fun fantasy wonder and adventure in the, much in the vein of uh, Chronicles of Narnia and things like that. That's what it was advertised as. But the movie is not that. It is dark and sad and nothing to do with fantasy. There's no magical realm or magical kingdom or anything. Like, and that's what the advertising it totally sold you on a bill of goods that this movie is a fantasy movie about children in a magical kingdom that they find in the forest and their magical, whimsical adventures. Never mind that the 12-year-old best friend dies and there's crying and grief and pain and there is no magical kingdom in the woods. And all, like, it's, it's just kind of crazy. Um, that was misleading. That was false advertising. The, I believe the second, it was either the second or third, uh, I believe it was the second Mission Impossible movie. That advertising came out and Anthony Hopkins was plastered all over the trailers. Like all over the trailer. He was in more than half of the trailer. Which, by logical extension, you think he's probably in more than half the movie. He's in like three minutes of the movie. And that's it. And yet he's plastered all over the trailer. That is false advertising. That is deceptive advertising. Misdirection, though, I think is a different thing. Maybe it's a fine line, but it is a line. Like, J.J. Abrams not revealing that uh, Benedict Cumberbatch was Khan in, uh, in the most in recent Star Trek movie. I wouldn't call that false advertising. That's a little bit of misdirection to keep the audience on their toes. It, it doesn't wholesale deceive you about a major thing about the film, you know? And those types of misdirections have often been used uh, for movies, and I think to good effect sometimes, sometimes not so good effect, but sometimes to good effect. Just because in this one particular case that one of the actors they're using to do a little bit of misdirection, and who knows, we don't know that it's misdirection, but let's for argument's sake say it is. And uh, misdirecting is to make us think John Boyega is like a Jedi character, and he's actually not. So we don't know, but let's just assume that for a second. Just because he happens to be black, I do not think that makes it a race issue, nor do I think it should be a race issue. But I also think you're right. There are going to be people out there who want to make it a race issue. You know, much like the Fox insulting Star Wars fans thing, I think sometimes movie fans are just looking for a reason to be offended. We are looking for something to be offended at. Even if there's not really something there that deserves to get offended at, as movie fans or video game fans or television fans or music fans or sneaker fans or whatever, we sometimes are all a little bit guilty of looking for something to get mad at. And I think you're right. If, if it turns out to be a bit of a misdirection, I think there'll be some people that get angry at that, much like the Fox thing with, uh, with Star Wars fans. But I, I really don't think it would mean anything. So will there be some backlash? Mm, probably, but I think it would be insignificant. Because um, while there are a lot of idiots out there, I still believe there are more smart people in the world than dumb people. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but I got to believe it. So anyway, all right, guys, that will do it for me for this installment of Collider Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining me, not just today, but also on yesterday's show and this weekend. Don't forget, um, you guys should be bookmarking Collider.com. It is simply the best website online for keeping you up to date on everything going on in the world of entertainment news. If you haven't done so already, bookmark Collider.com and what are you waiting for? Subscribe to this YouTube channel. 
click subscribe and do me a favor, share this video on your Facebook page, on your Twitter, wherever you'd like to do that. Make sure you click the thumbs up button to, as a way of communicating that you like our video. Leave a comment on any or all the questions that we've addressed here today. We want to hear from you. But remember, we're all film fans. So even if somebody in there says something you don't agree with, let's have a good fun discussion. Let's not devolve into things like a lot of the other idiots do into trolling and stuff like that. Keep it fun. Keep it civil. Let's benefit each other with our own points of view in movie discussion. That's what it's all about. So that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks a lot for joining me. My name is John Campio for Collider Video. Until next time, bye-bye.